Interestingly, there was a report in the Financial Times in the last week to say that the UK government had created a fund to encourage firms to go and retrieve former employees who um, are keen to work um, and to incentivise them to do that. So it's a bit of a push me pull you. I think enlightened firms understand that that investment is a wasted investment unless they proactively go back and retrieve it. But equally at a policy level, governments are realising the effect that this could have, that the re-entry of these valuable workers could have on GDP. And that work on the value that is being foregone has been done. And the other thing that's really driving it, and this is the sort of the policy spine of the book, is um, the commitment that both governments and business are now making to gender equality targets. If we do nothing more than what we're doing today, and there's quite a lot being done today, we won't see gender equality in the workplace for another 170 years. It's hard to believe. So if you want to achieve these targets more quickly, you're going to have to address, you know, this drain of female talent that seems to happen mid-career just as women are basically hitting their straps. And this is actually a pretty easy way of doing it. There's a lot happening at the policy level um, and the institutional level, and, I, and it's starting to happen more at the corporate level. But, you know, if you're a woman sitting at home thinking, I wish someone would find me, I feel as though I've got a lot to give, and I know that I've done a lot of... Uh, work myself, you know, I've got a good degree, I've done some hard yards in the workplace. If you could bridge that gap between where she is and where the big institutions are, you know, the World Bank and the World Economic Forum and the UN, and what governments and businesses are doing in the middle, you'd get a really good outcome. I think it's very easy when you're in full flight in a career to let those friendship networks fall away, because friendship networks take a lot of work to nurture and maintain. And the double whammy that a woman who's had a big career can experience is that she goes home, she's lost her identity that she associated with her working life, but she can also be very lonely. So reviving those networks is very important. And yes, they could be very helpful to you. And I think, again, the science will tell you that often the opportunities come from the least likely sources. It's not the big chairman of the Commonwealth Bank that will help you find that next role. It'll be someone who's on the periphery often of your life that you bump into in a very accidental way. I think the important thing is for a woman in that position to tell someone she's looking. The, the worst thing she can do is to harbour that secret for reasons of pride or feeling that she's not confident enough to tell someone. The lucky breaks that I have had have come my way because I've been sitting next to someone or talking to someone and I've told them I'm looking or I'd be open to something. Mm. And, and I've had a go. And that's, again, where the not-for-profit sector can come in, that it gives you the opportunity in a reasonably low-commitment way at the start to have a go and try a few different things and to see how it actually feels. Annabel Crabbe says that every successful woman needs a wife. Now, do you agree with that? Oh, I totally agree. <laughs> and, you know, it's, um, it's just so hard to be all things to all people. I totally agree with Annabelle Crabbe on that. It's just, and you sort of want that old school 1950s wife. You know, you want someone to look after you because it's really hard to, to be giving all day and then have to come home and, and give again, you know, after hours. Unless someone is, is sort of replenishing 
you know, those supplies. And, and in fact, you know, a very good example of that is, I don't know if you've ever read Mad Madeleine Albright's autobiography, but it's such a good book. She's very comfortable, I suppose, because she's just so incredibly secure and senior in talking about how difficult she found it um, when she first became the American ambassador to the UN. And she had a grace and favour apartment in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, which was very posh. But she had, as a result of her divorce, um, a farm down in Virginia. No doubt it's very gorgeous. But um, she said the worst thing was that it didn't matter whether she was in New York or in Virginia, whatever she needed to wear that day was always in the other house. Anyway, she decided she just couldn't cope on her own. Even though she had tons of help and all sorts of people around her, she decided that what she needed was effectively a wife. So her sister had recently been divorced and so she <laughs> invited her to apply for the position and her sister became effectively her, you know, her, her, her wife because she just felt she couldn't run the life that she needed to run with the expectations that attached to her being a woman. So, for instance, she had to entertain a lot um, at her apartment. And she said, you know, she had a cook and a butler and this and that, but she needed a wife to sort of inject the female touches that were expected, which, quite frankly, Madeleine Albright did not have time to do. So, you know, Annabelle Crabbe's right, but that's a very, it's, it, that's something that really stayed with me about Madeleine Albright.